at this point, uh, I am excited to introduce to you guys Mike and Gene Prop and their and their teenage sons here as well, uh, Mark and Luke. And uh, we'll go ahead and invite uh, Mike up on the stage and Gene up on the stage. And uh, we are having them here today as guests for the first time. We've never had them visit before. And uh, I had a chance to have dinner with them last night and sure enjoyed getting to know them a bit. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> That's good. And. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, this will be a fun chance for us to hear about their mission, and this is a mission that we as a church are praying about. Is this something that we want to partner with in the future? And either way, uh, we can be praying for them and, and, uh, and just enjoy hearing what God is doing in the Philippines through them. So with that, I'll pass things off to them. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Mike, this is my wife Jeanette, and we live in the Philippines. It is our first time in this part of Oregon. Um, forgive me, I know it's crazy hat day, I just can't bring myself to wear a hat up here doing this. But um, it was kind of appropriate that it's hat day because we wear a lot of hats. And um, Pam was generous enough to bring several examples. I don't normally wear pirate hats or big furry ear hats, although I think I could pull that one off. Um, but we were approached asking to come and share with this congregation about our orphanage ministry. And we're going to talk about a lot more than that. And oh, I need to turn the clicker on. Introduce yourself, honey, while I figure this out. I'm Jean, Jeanette. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting us over here. And I had the best dinner last night. <laughs> for the first time in my life, I ate bear burgers. And that was so exciting. <laughs> I told Pastor, it, it makes my list of the exotic foods that I've eaten. Up way up there with spiders. Yeah. And so thank you so much for that. Yeah. We heard bear burger, I thought, like a protein burger with no bun, but no, it was... It was real bear. Yeah. So we have been married since the year 2000. And shortly after we were married, we prayed a prayer. We asked God to help us be a part of something so big that it would fail if He did not show up in obvious ways. We knew we were called to serve Him, but we wanted to see Him and to know Him. And through a series of events, we realized we were being called to build an orphanage. And I clicked too many times. Um, this is a map of the Philippines, and there are two provinces where we do most of our work. Bohol, which is a little to the right of center um, on the map, and Mindanao, which is the southernmost province. Mindanao is the one that you might hear about on the news when Muslims start cutting people's heads off in the Philippines. That's where we work. But we were surprised the day after we prayed, asking God to let us be a part of something so big that it would fail if He didn't show up in obvious ways. The next day, someone knocked on our door offering land for sale. And that was unusual. And we prayed about it and felt it was God's answer to that prayer. And it took some time for us to realize that land was meant for an orphanage. But the journey really has been one of seeing God show up again and again in ways that can only be described by Him. This is Village of Hope. We've got four homes now. We're in the process of preparing to build two more. We've already got everything graded. Each home holds about 10 kids. There's a Christian couple that has agreed to serve as their parents. So whereas some orphanages hold kids until they can be adopted, we've chosen not to put our kids up for adoption. We feel they've already lost mom and dad once. We don't want to do that to them again. So we're creating a new family. We bring the kids into a new home. And it is um, it's something special to see because they really do become brother and sister and mom and dad. Let's see, more orphanage pictures. <laughs> Forgive us, we um, were just putting this together last night. <laughs> and um, we, we want to see kids heal both in terms of their bodies, but also their souls. Not only the universal, we all need Jesus or we're going to go to hell, but the, these kids have come from really hard backgrounds. In the Philippines, there's about 103 million people, according to the latest census, about a million and a half of them are kids living on the streets. 
And so Jeanette's going to tell you the story of a little girl who was left alone. This is Mary Jane. Mary Jane in this picture is six years old. I was on an island. I was asked by the government to interview a widow who needed help. And Mary Jane was brought in into the clinic. She, was, she could barely stand up, and she was pale and hurting. Mary Jane's mom left her and her two siblings on a little island. Basically, the island's like you can walk from end to end in that island. It's got about 3,000 people. She was hoping that somebody would take care of Mary Jane and the siblings, but no one ever did. And so Mary Jane got very, very hungry, and she started eating sand. And so that's why she was brought into the clinic, because she was very, very sick. And as soon as I saw her, it's like, this kid needs help. So we took her to the hospital, and she, we went to the local hospital. They couldn't help her, so we had to go two hours away to another hospital. And she had to have blood transfusions because she was so full of parasites. Explain the sand. Oh, <laughs> the, it's a small fishing island. So the men would go out and fish and come back to the shore, clean their fish. And it's a small island. No one has a septic tank, but there's an ocean everywhere. The sand was not clean. And between the fish parts left behind and the bugs that wanted to eat those fish parts and people using the shore as a restroom, um, Mary Jane got quite sick. She needed nine units of blood. When you're that small, you only have about four in your body. She needed everything changed. Our son Mark was three at the time. He was taller and heavier than her at age six. And through God giving her a chance to live, she's now in high school. And she loves to sing. She loves to dance. She's not distended, so she doesn't fall over anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, she is someone that when you walk in the room and she's there, you get happy. And most of all, she loves Jesus, and she loves teaching kids. And that's what, one of what we do at Village of Hope. Yeah. There's another boy at the orphanage named Jonathan. Jonathan was born with a cleft lip and palate. When we met him, his mother had passed away, and his father was in an accident and was a paraplegic. He couldn't move from the waist down. We met him. He knocked at our door and had a letter in his hand. His family had been to the governor's office, they, excuse me, the mayor's office, and to help him in his poverty, they gave him a letter that says, this boy really is poor. Please give him money if he begs. And he came to us begging. And we fed him. We fed his father. And at the orphanage, we want to bring families together, not pull them apart. But his father really wasn't able to care for him because of his injuries. And so Jonathan... Um, we decided we would move him into the orphanage. And his father, we found a family in the church to care for him. I got to baptize his dad in the ocean. It's um, always great to baptize people. It's exciting. And I hope you have a lot more than three next week, Pastor. <laughs> Baptizing a paraplegic in the tide is interesting. <laughs> and you know what? It changes things. And Jonathan, he had some changes too. We found a surgeon we were able to do some work on him. He is now an adult. He's been through culinary school. Before, he couldn't keep food in his mouth, and now he is a sous chef at a resort. He is applying to be a chef on a cruise line. Um, you see him there on the side with a lady. That's Mila. Mila was raised in Village of Hope Home 1. Jonathan was raised in Village of Hope Home 4. They fell in love and gave us our very first Village of Hope grandbaby. So we're Lola and Lolo, grandma and grandpa. And we still aren't sure how we feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just lives get to be changed when you love a kid and tell them that Jesus loves them too. And um, the way that these kids just come to us, because we, we had, when we were praying about we want to be a part of something, God, where you have to be there, we heard him say orphanage. And the conversation went something to the effect of, so we'll build an orphanage and give it away to someone to run? No, you'll run the orphanage. So we'll build the orphanage, we'll design the policies, and then give it away? Because at our heart, we're soul winners, we're church planners. In our mind, this is humanitarian work. 
But it turns out having an orphanage opens so many doors for the gospel. We'll get a call to go visit someone like Jonathan or Mary Jane, and we'll be in a new community to us, and people will ask, that's not your kid. Why do you care for them so much? Well, can we come back on Saturday for three hours and talk to you and your friends about who Jesus is and why we love the people that Jesus loves? And there are doors that open again and again. And we're going to tell you a little bit about Angela. She was 13 here. She's 17 now. This picture is a little bit old. But something happened when she was 13. One day, Angela, who also lived in Home One, came to us and asked if she could have some ribbon from our craft box. Sure. Why? And she explained that she had taken 10 Bible studies that we use to lead someone from no concept of faith to, you know what you need to know, now is the time to decide which way will you go for eternity. And she copied those Bible studies with her allowance money. And at school, behind the bathroom, she had 30 kids that she was leading through these 10 Bible studies. And she said, I want to do a little graduation for the ones who finished, so I need some ribbon. Yes, you can have some ribbon. <laughs> what else do you need? And later she came back and actually asked, do you have a Bible study to teach people how to lead Bible studies? Because the group is getting too big for me. <laughs> and so, you know, being a, a good pastor guy, I said, Angela, you're 13. You need to wait till you're in Bible college to do anything for the king. No, I didn't say that. We are passionate about the idea of the priesthood of all believers. And that flows from our church planning ministry into the orphanage. And we've got a little video now we'll show you that some of our orphanage kids made, actually. And it's going to tell you a little bit more about our orphanage. And it's going to tell you the story of Christina, a girl who came to us after her mother and her father passed away. sisters too I'm only 14 and friends well I've got them too it makes a difference when friends help those who are in need and take the hand of those who are just like me and nurses they are needed still teachers can teach us nurses can keep us well we are encouraged by all the love that you give and from a dim past a brighter future's ahead I'm going to harvest my cucumber. Our clothes and 
also we are taught how to be uh, good examples to other children in the orphanage. So they will be confident that we can live in our own. So now uh, I am uh, I am now a research social worker. So uh, I really thank uh, the sponsors who support who supported the Village of Hope. I hope that my testimony will be uh, a blessing to others and more people to be inspired and encouraged to pursue their dreams, their life, and especially trusting God for everything. Uh, even in, in the good and bad situations, I know that God has a perfect plan and purpose in my life and our life. I hope that uh, you are blessed for my story. Thank you. joys that we see is when we have a full circle like that, when somebody who was a, a client, we, yeah, uh, somebody that we serve is now serving others too. And uh, as a World Vision kid myself, I grew up and I'm hoping that someday in one of these trips I bump into my sponsors because I was a World Vision kid for so long. And to be able to do this for others and pay it forward is such a special thing. We got to be a part of building an orphanage, and we get to be a part of, right now there are 57 kids who we get to be a part of their story, and that's incredible to us. And even more amazing to me is how we have seen God show up again and again in the obvious ways that we asked Him to do so. Next week, we won't be here, but you'll be, and then you'll be in the park. And um, we didn't talk about this, but pastor challenged you to invite a friend to church, not to goulash, but to church. <laughs> and just an idea off the cuff. Um, how many of you have one friend, at least? <laughs> or even just somebody you know who's not your friend? I bet it wouldn't be too hard for you to say, you know what, next week my church is doing something different. Why don't you come with me, and then we're going to go to the park, and we're going to eat goulash. But... You could do that pretty much on your own. I challenge you, pray today and ask God for a number, a number much bigger than you could do on your own. Father God, how many people do you want me to bring next week? I can bring one on my own. How many will I need to trust in you for? And maybe it's 20 people. Maybe it's 10. Maybe it's 500. Who do you know that you can ask? Pick a number so big that you'll fail unless you see God's hand in it. And that's a great way to get to see God's hand in what you're doing and in your life. And, um, and that's just bonus. That's not on a slide anywhere. We mentioned that we're church planters at heart. We're soul winners at heart. And we went to a special program at Hope International University where we were trained by the leaders of the biggest Christian churches in America. And it was an incredible program, and we learned so many things that when God called us to the jungle, weren't exactly useful anymore. <laughs> and we tried really hard to build a really big church. It didn't work very well. And we were exposed to something later on called Jonathan training, named after Jonathan, the son of Saul, who said, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And Jonathan training was about taking the church and making it as simple as possible and as reproducible as possible so that anyone in the church can realize there's a ministry for them to do. And we won't all be pastors, we won't all be preachers, but the Bible says that there's a priesthood of all believers. 
if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you've got just as much going for you as pastor does. And so there is a challenge for the whole church to do the work of the church. And um, as a result, we thought we wanted to build one big church. God has blessed us with being a part of nearly a hundred small churches instead and getting to train leaders and getting to watch people who, well, I don't know how to read, but if you'll tell me what to say, I'll share my faith with someone. And um, there's a church called Kanumai, and again, I'll let her tell the story. Tell the story to the pastor yesterday. Kanumai is a church, when we got involved, it was 21 years old. And the, the, the people in this church would come together and wait for a Bible college student to show up before they would start any service. And they would do this for Wednesday services, for Sunday services. They felt like they couldn't start the service without a Bible college student. And we took them through the, this whole concept of priesthood of all believers. And, one, and so uh, there was a paradigm shift in the church. And one day, Jenilyn, one of um, our girls, was leading worship and said, anyone in this church who is involved, involved in church planting in, um, outreach. and outreach, please come to the front and we'll pray for you. Every single adult in this church came up to the front. There were the only kids left. And so generally I said, kids, let's all surround your parents and let's pray for them as, as they go out. And that's how it changed from a church that just waits to be fed to a church that goes out into the community. And really, what, what we try to do is encourage every single one to be a light wherever the Lord has put them. We, sorry, I'm looking at the time. <laughs> um, okay, one story. We will bring people from all these small churches together often. Um, we try at least once a month, sometimes it's once a quarter, sometimes there's a thing called COVID that keeps it from happening. But because they are smaller churches, there can be a little sense of discouragement, well, I'm just part of a little church and I want to be part of a big church. Well, when we bring everyone together, it's a big church. And on these weekends, because there are so many new believers, we focus on things like discipleship ideas, Bible study techniques, how to share your faith. We'll teach new worship songs or even how to play guitar. And one weekend, we were focusing on using Bible stories to communicate the gospel to people around you. Because Filipinos, they're oral le learners. They like stories. They'll sit under a tree and talk all day long, even if you want to go home and sleep. And they'll just keep talking. And we had this weekend where we were going to focus on sharing Bible stories. One of the ladies in one of the churches had a baby. And she asked the neighbor child, can you come with me, hold the baby, while I'm in my class, bring the baby to me if the baby needs to nurse or if there's any problems, and that's what they did. The weekend ended, they went home. A few days later, this girl knocked on the mother's door. I need more stories. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, in your class, you talked about three stories and you practiced them and you said, get people together and share these stories. I have 70 kids now that I've had near my house and I've told them all three stories. I need more stories. She gave her more stories. <laughs> she went and she helped. And today, there actually is a church in that community because of this little girl who was bold enough to tell three stories to little children. And, you know, one of the, uh, the people that we trained picked it up, and now there's a church, a thriving church in that area. Mm -hmm. And God has blessed us with opportunity to share these ideas throughout the Philippines and even other parts of Asia. We've trained church planters from 21 of the Philippines' 82 provinces, as well as church planters from Indonesia and Thailand. We believe that the church in the Philippines has been told to go into all the world making disciples and baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded them. And so we began a new program called the All Nations Initiative. And the idea is we're, we're missionaries with Team Expansion. If you've heard of them, great. They're usually not known on this side of America. They're a really good organization that loves us well and supports us in what we do. And they are designed for Westerners. And there are things that an American might need emotionally or legally that a Filipino wouldn't need. 
and there are things a Filipino needs that I sure don't, like rice. And, <laughs> and so we wanted to create something to be what team expansion is to us for Filipino believers who are going into other places. And sometimes they go by foot, sometimes they go by motorbike. This one is stuck in the mud, and um, how beautiful are their feet anyway because they're bringing good news. We have lately been able to acquire several boats because there are several small island villages, like where we met Mary Jane, places where you can't take a motorbike to go share the gospel. And um, it's because we want people to hear the good news. We want them to find faith in Christ, to join Him in the waters of baptism, and then to go out and be missionaries themselves because they are new believers. And so the All Nations Initiative, we've already got funding to send three Filipinos into Indonesia, two into China, and they would have been there already if it weren't for a little thing called COVID. And, um, but we're pushing forward because there are still billions of people who need to hear the gospel. Right now, we have a family. I just got their newsletter today. I didn't tell you. Um, we have a family that we have moved into a Muslim village in Mindanao and pray for them. I can't tell you their names because we're on the internet, but pray for them. They're in a place that is dangerous, and they have to trust in God that their message will survive the danger and change a family or a village or a community forever. One of the things that we do, and we didn't mean to be this, is disaster relief work. Um, one of the very first disasters that we ever worked in was a village that is uh, uh, a landslide where 1,126 people died. And so that was one of the, when we saw that, it's like the church has to do something. And so that's how we became involved. And over, ever, ever since, we've done earthquakes, um, Landslide. landslides, volcanic eruptions. <laughs> <laughs> so floods, <laughs> floods, and um, but on December of 2021, after we came back from a trip here in America, two weeks after after that, a big typhoon hit us, and it was very much more personal to us. We woke up one morning, and everything that we have built for the last 20 years was down, and or the roof blew away, and so that this is where. Uh, that has filled our year and a half. Mm -hmm. Before we came here, that was everything that we did was about rebuilding our areas, our orphanage and our yeah. work. So this is another video made by our orphanage kids that explains the days after that typhoon. That's our living room. That's our garage. That's our church. Shattered like you've never been before The life you knew In a thousand pieces on the floor And words fall short in times like these When this world drives you to your knees You think you're never gonna get back To the you they used to be Tell your heart to beat again Close your eyes and breathe it in Let the shadows fall away What's the new one? Step into the light of grace Yesterday is a closing door You don't live there anymore Say goodbye to where you've been And tell your heart to beat again Just let that word wash over you It's alright now Love's healing hands have pulled you through So get back up, take step one Leave the darkness, feel the sun Cause your story's far from over And your journey's just begun Tell your heart to be Tell your heart to beat again Let it 
We've been in storms before. We've helped thousands of people. After an earthquake in Bohol in 2013 and after a storm two weeks later on the eastern coast of the Philippines, we got to see how people who are devastated are open to God and what He's willing to do in them and for them. And this time, like Jeanette said, it was different because it was our house without a roof and it was our car that was upside down. And it was our boy's playhouse that was crushed. And yet God moved people around the world to give generously. And we were able to help 750 families rebuild their homes in the last year and a half. We were able to help rebuild a few church schools. And um, <laughs> we're going to go home in a few weeks and finish fixing our house. We still have some windows to change and some doors to rehang. The, after the typhoon, we, didn't, we couldn't get food because the, the market was damaged. But the day before the typhoon, two boxes came, arrived. And in this boxes, and this is from somebody we did not know, in this boxes, there were cans of food and pancake mixes and spaghetti, and that helped us throughout the week that we needed to eat. And God knew that we needed these boxes. These boxes take about six, six weeks to get to us. And also, the other box was filled, it was so close to Christmas time, we were worried that we wouldn't have any gifts for those little angels <laughs> that you saw. But in the other box, it was filled with uh, toys, unopened toys, the little boxes of toys for these kids. And it was just such a, um, a testimony of how much the Lord knew that we needed these things. And we could be going through we're not immune to typhoons in our lives, but God has already provided for you. Yeah. The story about the boxes being shipped weeks before any weatherman knew that the storm was even coming, it, it reminds me of a time when God somehow moved someone to plant a sycamore tree in just the right spot years before Zacchaeus would need it to climb up to see Christ. And, um, you know, I've been told how logging has taken some pretty big hits in this part of Oregon. I wouldn't be surprised if someday the government said, you know what, cows are bad for the environment, no more cattle either. And um, I don't know what storms are going to come into all of our lives, but God goes before us, and God sees what we will need before we do. And the same God who moved a stranger to ship boxes to an orphanage weeks before anyone knew there would be a need, He goes before all of us. And he's got the whole world in his hands. And in the middle of the typhoon, our orphanage, the, the roof started going, uh, flying off, and the ceilings started coming down. In fact, some of our kids were wearing helmets, and they were hiding under the bunk beds. And then they realized, if our home that's very solid is blowing away, what will happen to our neighbors whose whole houses are made of huts of, of light wood? And they remember that they had a neighbor that just had a baby two months ago. And so the house dads and the, the uh, uh, boys went and braved through the wind and the rain and the debris and tried to go and rescue them, go over the hill. And when they got there, sure enough, the houses weren't there. And the mom and the families that were around there were hiding under a fallen tree. And they said, we thought we were going to perish, but then we saw a light from the distance. We saw a light coming from Village of Hope, and we knew we would be safe. And we tell people that just the word picture, of, just imagine the darkness, the darkness that we are all living in right now. And you are a point of light in that darkness. We encourage everyone to just shine your light wherever the Lord has put you. We need missionaries here in America, even more so than ever before. Every time we come here, we are so surprised at the changes that's happening in this culture. 
And we need people like you to stand up and be lights in your communities. In this community, thank you so much for all that you guys are doing in this community. We got to help a lot of people. There's a village near us called Titipa. In Titipa, it's a communist bulwark in Bohol. It's often had firefights with the government. And after the storm, we realized nobody would go and help Titipa. We wanted to. We wanted to go see what their needs were. We needed a military escort to go into the town, but we got there and we saw people whose homes had collapsed, whose farms were flooded with mud, whose, we know people whose cows drowned during the storm. And these people needed help, and we were able to help them. We left for America on April 15th. April 9th, nine people from Thithipa were baptized. And while we were in America, this communist bulwark had its first organized church service in their village. And God uses disasters to change things. Mm -hmm. It is tragic that we need an orphanage. I would love for Village of Hope to go out of business because families stay together and parents don't die. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. And I would love for there not to be any more communists shooting at the government, but I love the fact that even in a place like that, the gospel changes lives. We have one last video, not made by Village of Hope Kids this time. We had a get-together of more than a 1,000 people, um, some during the day, some during the night. They came together for Easter weekend, and we were going to celebrate, basically we were calling it the last page of the chapter of the storm, and we talked about what God did and the doors He opened, and um, we'll end with this. God moved His church around the world to give generously. 16 months later, we come together to celebrate what God has accomplished. Homes are rebuilt, livelihoods are restored, new churches are started. People have come to faith that they did not have before, and that's because Christ was there. Malona Avenido, nagbuyo sa Isla Sagindakpan. Ako di ay si Laurita Badinas. Oo, oh, ako di ay si Jumari Badinas. Tagum Norte. Alan ko pala ay si San Mark Almarante. Sitlan, Pinavista, Bohol. Punta ay si Ronald Turipil. Ika, Mandawa Binunito. a massive typhoon hit Bohol and the surrounding provinces and it brought a lot of destruction. And this weekend is about celebrating new beginnings, new life, and new faith that the disaster with God's help has turned into a victory. Magpalakpakan na ito ang ginawa na. Bible time! Nagasalamat ginoo sa different times, different kinds of gifts that you have given to us. Salamat sa mga talinto nga unique ng mga gasa aron ang gamiton para sa pagmayas sa mga lahat. thousand people together this weekend who are here to tell their stories to celebrate what God has done in the last year and a half. The Lord has really opened doors through this disaster so that people could know Him and know that He loves them. Salamat ko sa ginoo nga. Huwag ko kabati niya to nga. Murag paminaw na ko nga. Nahi ginoo nga. Nagkuhan mo. Kung wala pa tong operation heart beat, hila maingato siguro. May mo sab ang ilahang kinabuhi. 
maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. O sa tanan ng mga tao kay gamit sa Ginoo nga nag-support sa uh, ministries, may malaking tiwala din po sa amin na bigyan kami ng livelihood. Pasalamat ning dako sa tanang mga tao nga nag-support sa BUH o sa misa mga nakabinipit sa inyong hangtabang. Salamat sa mga tabang ani abot sa kinabuhi. Bustak datang tanah. All that he has rebuilt both in them and around them since the typhoon. And so much of that was made possible because so many people overseas were so generous with the people here in their time of need. We want to thank you for what you've given and the lives you've changed. Thank you, friends, for joining us in this incredible calling God has given us. Together, we are reaching the lost and changing eternities. You bless us. Thank you. The storm was ugly. We've baptized more than 100 people that we did not know before the storm. There are multiple churches meeting in places we weren't working before the storm. And God keeps showing up. Father God, I thank you for this church and for stories about you and your faithfulness. I pray that the people in this place will see you show up as they pursue you. Please use this church to change this community, this state, this country, and this world. And I know there are people today with hurts in their hearts who are here. We trust your Holy Spirit to be a comfort and a guide and a healer. And I ask, Father God, that as this church lives out its role of being salt and light, that the lost will see you, and they will know you, and they will give their lives to you. But I also pray that as this church lives out being salt and light, that the members will get to see you do things they never imagined. We trust that you will show yourself faithful, and we thank you that we get to be a part of your story, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.